Gospels to 1 Timothy chapter 5. As we went through the first part of chapter 5, it was talking to us, to Timothy, as a young man, as a young pastor, and how he's to be the example to the church, and how to deal with people in the church. He said not to rebuke an older man, but to exhort him as a brother, or as a father, as younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters. We talk about this being our church family, and it is because we're all adopted into the family of God. We're all part of the same body, and we're a family. And most of the time, we act like it. We love each other. We're we're there for each other. We exhort one another, and sometimes we butt heads. You know, Lord, Lord uh, refers to us often as sheep, and sheep, you know, sometimes they're just happy going around playing and doing their things, and sometimes they kick and bite one another. But Timothy, to honor those, talked about widows and honoring widows, those that were truly widows, those women that, that found themselves widowed, that had family, sons and them to help to take care of them and, and all that because when she lost when the husband was dead she lost that whatever that inheritance might be for the most part and had no way to take care of herself but the children to step up and take care of them to help them out that's the the, the duty if you will the, of a godly family it says if you don't do this then you're even worse than an unbeliever but it talked about Younger widows and older widows. We talked about busy-bodied widows roaming around from house, just, you know, gossiping and doing all that stuff. Now they don't have to go anywhere. They do it on Twitter and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. The idea was that not only doing that, but being distracted, growing wanton against the Lord, and wandering off, running astray from that instead of being focused. Being focused on still ministering. Oftentimes, you have those that, that, that lose a spouse, and the spouse and all that was the focus of their life. And that's the way it happens sometimes, but the focus ought to always be on the Lord first, them second. And they would find themselves not, not having that focus and, and run astray. And they said for the younger widows that they could marry and, and raise families and all that. And we looked at, if you're going to marry as a believer, marry somebody else that's a believer. Don't be unequally yoked. We always looked at it, if you're unequally yoked, you will be equally yoked. So it's important to find somebody that's a believer that has the same heart and passion as you do. Okay? So we went on about the, the widows and all that. Verse 16, we'll look at that one. It says, If any believing man or woman has widows, then let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows, those who have no one to help them out. And the church can come alongside and and do that, as we would our spiritual mothers and sisters. Verse 17 says, Let elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may fear, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake. And for your frequent infirmities, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. 
Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those who are otherwise cannot be hidden. And again, Paul is, is directing this letter to Timothy to exhort him, this young pastor, and train him up in the way that he should go here in Ephesus. So he's giving these pointers as a pastor look at these things. But these things apply in principle to all of us. Because as we pointed out before, in one way or another, all of us have someone that's looking up to us. We have someone, hopefully, that we're looking up to and someone looking up to us. We all have someone looking at us, whether it be another believer or those out in the world looking to see us. Interesting, isn't it, how sometimes the unsaved know more about what a Christian should look like than Christians seem to? Being an example, and especially that of a pastor. We went through the requirements of the pastor, the elders, and that. That they had to have a, a reputation in the church, now the church, and in their home. That it begins there. It starts with that home life and having that in order. It says, let the elders, verse 17, who rule well, be counted worthy of a double honor particularly those who labor in the word and doctrine. It says, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. It says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. That's that respect. That, that portion. It's like, Count them worthy. Those who are, who are laboring in the word and doctrine. We found out that it was the, the difference between the deacon and the elder was that the elder had to be able to teach. So they're spending their time working in that. Doing that. Give them a double honor. Take care of them. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul was talking about him and Barnabas, and they're, they're, they're um, people saying that they weren't that they shouldn't be allowed to you know be supported by the church and all that. He says in verse seven, he says, "Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink the milk of the flock, do I say these things as a mere?" Man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, it is written that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who Threshes in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sworn spiritual, have sown, sorry, spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers in this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the things of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. You're supposed to answer this call in your life to go and be a, a preacher and spend your time doing that, then you ought to be taken care of by those whom you're working for. You're laboring for and preaching the gospel and being that minister and being that elder. Um, a lot of people there with Paul and them, they had an issue with that. Well, who are you? Why, we, why, why should we be supporting you? Sometimes people have that today. Well, if you're going to go out there and start a church, do you have the money to support it? If the, if the guy wants to do that, if the pastor wants to do it, is he the one that's going to go and support it? You come into the church, and you see the one that has to support it? So you're sowing to the spiritual thing. You're putting your time and effort into sowing spiritually into these people's lives. He says, is it a big deal if we reap of your material things? 
That doesn't mean they get to come over to your house and say, hey, I like that, man. Let me take this, you know, and all that. But it's talking about them being supported. It goes back to the Old Testament, to Moses' law there. It says, don't muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. The ox is out there doing its work, pulling whatever it's pulling and everything. Let it nibble on the stuff as it's doing this. It talks about going to war at their own expense. You know, how many of you would sign up for that? Hey, if you got $100,000, you can come sign up and go over here and come to war with us. Probably not, huh? <laughs> you know, probably not. You go into this, and there, there's a, a, a right to, to have that expectation. You sow in the field. You expect to reap something. We have little trees planted in our yard. And they're not very big yet, but they're supposed to be fruit trees. We'll see. We'll see. But we go out there and tend to them and water them and all that kind of stuff. And look, and now, right now, it's cool because they get little flowers on them. You're going, <laughs> all right. You know, you get them little tiny little buds that pop out there of, of fruit and everything. You're going, yeah. You know, and you can look and see the birds hanging around going, is that ready yet? <laughs> you know. But you have an expectation. You put into this and you have an expectation back. These people that, that are going and giving up whatever else it may be that they would do or did making their living, giving up that or a part of that to be focused on the church. Paul, it says, was a, a tent maker. He came into a place and he started preaching the ministry and he found a job and went to work to support himself. And then as the church has grown and is able to do so, then, then the church steps in and takes care of that. He says, uh, I like this, and I think it's kind of neat that it shows up on potluck day. Elders who rule worthy, are to be counted worthy of a double, uh, a double honor. So if you see me with two plates, <laughs> okay, don't say anything. It's all right. Two cherry pies, one in each hand. Amen. Yep. Yep. Now, I've already been snacking on a couple of chips there, so as I was plowing them, you know. <laughs> but it's about, it's about that, that taking care of them who are in that. The Levites, it talked about them that did the work on the altar. They were partakers of it. That's how they, they lived. God set them apart and said, you know, you're not to be out there farming and, and, and running your herds and all that stuff like that. Your place is to be focused here on the ministry in the temple. And the people with their tithes, their gifts, their offerings and stuff like that, that's where their support comes from. As it is within the church. He says, those elders who rule well and spend their time laboring in the Word and in doctrine. They're there and that's their focus. That's their priority. That's the first thing that, they, that they're about and what they do. There's many of us like here with you know, smaller churches. Yeah, well, I, I got another job too. You know, and all that. But the church is there. The church supports. It supplies what it can based on what's brought in. Does a very good job of that. You know, thank you guys. I appreciate that. You know, you don't expect it for nothing. You know, there's an expectation. So the laborer, verse 18, says the scriptures say that you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. The laborer is, is worthy of his wages. Look over at Matthew chapter 10. Start in verse 5. The way, way it started as the Lord sent the twelve out. Verse 5, These twelve Jesus sent out, commanding them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preaching, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. They receive this commission, this call of God. He's given them this to go and do. You know, don't keep it to yourself. Give it out. 
God's called them and gifted them to go out to preach the gospel and to, to minister people and all these things. So it's been given to you freely. You didn't earn it. It wasn't because of, you know, all the things you did. It's because the Lord's given this blessing to them. It says, freely you've been giving, given, freely give. Don't hold back. Now that's to those that minister, to those, and we all do, right? We all figured out, found out we're ministers, right? Servants. We're all ministering something, some way. The Lord's given to us freely this gift of the Holy Spirit, this salvation and everything. Don't hang on to it tightly. It's been given to you freely. Freely give it out. Just go do it. Share the gospel. Share these things. Sends them out. Says, just go do it freely. Doesn't say, you know what? <laughs> and I read about this stuff and I remember that song and I forget who sings it right now, but that Brother Loves Traveling Salvation Show. You know? Remember that? That you, you might not remember that song. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Come and get a, a, a ticket to, to see the show. You know, they were out there just doing this, not putting on a show. They, did, they didn't charge admission or anything. They didn't say, hey, you know what? You guys over there in the town get together, and if you can rake up a few bucks over here, maybe we'll come to your town and preach the gospel and do that. And there are some these days that do stuff like that. You know? Freely you're given, you receive, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for the work is, worker is worthy of his food. It's also telling them, don't worry about whether you already have the provisions to go and do this or not. God's given you freely all these things, just go and do it. Go preach the gospel. Trust in Him. And He'll provide for your way. If you've been called to go and do that, to preach the gospel, to, to be in the ministry, go do it. Be faithful first. Don't pack up your bag. Don't make sure, well, see, I've got enough money. Well, I can be gone for two weeks. You know, just go do it. Don't worry about whether you have the material things there. It says the worker is worthy of his food. He tells them, don't worry about all that stuff. Don't worry about the people in the towns. God's going to take care of you. You'll get taken care of. He'll provide for you. Where God guides. God provides. And the provision will be there. Send them out saying, don't, don't you take care of it. Let them do it. So when you go to house to house, go there. Whatever they give you, take it. Take whatever it is that they have to offer. The Lord, through the people that you minister to, will provide for the needs. Back in 1 Timothy. The laborer is worthy of his wages. It says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest may also, are also may fear. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except for by two or three witnesses. Never really a good idea to receive an accusation against someone by just one person say so, because it's their word against theirs. There needs to be witnesses, doesn't there? And in this day and age, when there's accusations and everything, it's usually that, that the person accused is guilty until proven innocent. He's telling Timothy, don't just, when somebody says something, not to just ignore it, but to make sure that there's other witnesses to back it up, that you have the proof. Don't just say, you know, somebody says, well, elder so-and-so did this and that. Oh, well, we're going to, you know, take them out and stone them. Check it out. There has to be support there. There has to be those two or three witnesses. It's got to be the evidence. It's got to be proved. It says, and if those are sinning, those who are sinning, rebuke in the presence of all. If you find out that it is true, whether it's the elders or, or somebody else, rebuke them. Say, hey, you know what? There's a problem here. And deal with it. We look at that, rebuking somebody in the presence of all, and go, <gasps> Shouldn't we just sort of keep it secret and you know, hush them up and send them out the door? Needs to be confronted. 
Jesus says if somebody sins, sins against you, go to them first and talk to them about it. And that doesn't matter who you are, whether you're an elder, a deacon, or, or what the situation is. He says go to them first. Not last. Not after you've talked to everybody else. Because that's kind of what we do. We get on the, you know, go around and say, well, you know, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did this. You know, the last thing we want to do is go talk to them. Confront them, but do it in a spirit of love and, and restoration. Just go and talk to them. It says, and if they, they don't hear you, then bring somebody else. Bring somebody else to witness so that they can see what's going on. See what they have to say. You'd be surprised how often when that actually happens that there's just a misunderstanding in some way. Well, you said this. Well, yeah, but I didn't really mean it that way. I mean it this way. You know? That's another thing about that, that you know, texting and that kind of stuff. You don't, you don't really get to, to hear the person's heart in there. You know, if somebody types something in there in capital letters and everything, you don't know if they're yelling at you or just really excited about it. You know? And who knows what them little emoji things mean? (laughs) Come and confront, establish the fact, and make sure there's not a misunderstanding. And if it needs to go further than that, then you bring it before the, the, the church, the elders. And deal with it. And if they don't won't receive the truth, the facts are established, and they don't want to make things right, then you deal with it. Then you put them out of the fellowship. And it says to treat them as a tax collector and a th- and a heathen. What do you do with them? You put a big red letter on their forehead or something like that. Stand them out on the corner with a sign saying that you know so and so did this and that. What do you do with a tax collector and a heathen? Ignore them or show them the love of Christ as somebody that needs to get right with Jesus. You don't treat them as you would somebody else in fellowship. Yeah, there's that. But you don't throw rocks at them either. And you deal with it. You bring it out so that people can, can not just be confronted, but to, to pray about it. There was a problem and not necessarily hiding it. You know, doesn't mean you have to make a spectacle out of them in that situation, but do it in a, in a, in a loving and, and in a kind way. James chapter 3. This is James chapter 3, verse 1. This is an inter- inter- interesting verse given that it comes right before a whole paragraph on watch your tongue it says my brethren let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment and we already went through the requirements of the elders the teachers and everything like that and they're held to a a, a higher standard or they have to have that witness and everything where there's somebody who may be growing in the Lord that's not quite ready for that position that place they may have the desire, but they're not quite ready. He says, let not many of you become teachers because they're held to a stricter judgment. And that doesn't mean that, that you have to be a, you know, how do I want to put this? It means you have, to, you have to make sure that what you're teaching is right. It means that it's not only the people that are going to be judging what you're saying, but, but the Lord, you're there representing Him and His truth. And it's something that, that as a teacher of the Word, you want to, understand this that you're accountable for those things not just before your congregation but before the Lord and there are those I've talked to to pastors to teachers over the years that you know understood that their accountability to being faithful to the Lord and the Word of God took precedence over being accountable to the people that they were ministering to because there's times when the people that are ministering to say hey we'd rather you didn't talk about this but put this spin on it you know don't really talk about the 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 cross and the blood of christ because that makes some people kind of cringe good because it was your sin yours and mine that put him on that cross in the first place and ought to make you cringe 
Don't talk about, you know, don't use that dirty little three-letter word. You know what it is? Sin. It's what the Word of God says. Be faithful to that because there's an accountability in that. We're held accountable by God to this. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. says to us and it speaks to both it says obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would not or for that would be unprofitable to you the part of this speaking to the the minister to the leader to the pastor to the elder is the part of the job description, they're there to to look out for their souls, their spiritual needs, to minister to their spiritual needs, first of all, not not everything else. That comes first. That's part of that job of the elder, that being able to teach. That's the ministry. They're there with the call of God upon them to look out for the flock and their their spiritual well-being. And they're accountable to the Lord for it. It's one of those things that as as a minister, as a pastor, as a teacher, you look at that and you go, it's one of those things that, that, you know, that, that, that keeps me praying, oh Lord, keep me out of your way up there this morning. If it's not from you, let it fall on the floor. Let them not hear it. Because there's an accountability there. You're there looking out for their souls as those who must give an account. The Lord holds us accountable for those things. Is there a higher standard for someone who's a minister? In a sense, yes. Because of the calling that you're called to. doesn't mean that they're any different, that they're somebody special or anything. There's someone that the Lord's called. He's reminding Timothy, remember these things, Timothy, as you look at these elders, these ones that are are there laboring in the Word. They're worthy of a double honor, not just the pay, but the respect that comes with it. And then you get into that where you you see stuff like within within the Catholic Church and they put the Pope on such a high pedestal and everything that they, well, whatever the Pope says, he's infallible. Well, how would you like that job? That would cause you to watch your mouth, wouldn't it? You'd hope so, but it doesn't always. Some of the stories you read about some of the popes are like, woo. They put such a, 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 raise that person up in that calling and everything like that to such a high level that they get to, to acting like they're the kings instead of the servants. That they're there to be served and to, to be waited on instead of being the one waiting. Minister means that servant. Jesus gave the example to His disciples by doing what? Girding Himself up and washing their feet. And that foot washing job was not the job you wanted to have back in those days. They roamed around out there in the dirt with their sandals and walked around where all the animals walked around. Out in the streets, all them little donkeys doing little donkey things out there. You know? The job of washing the the guests' feet when they came in, that was the lowest of the servants' positions in the house. Say, you're on the bottom rung here, dude. You know, you get to go wash their feet. It wasn't a pleasant thing. It wasn't a pleasant thing. And he made that example, and he told them who he sent out. He says, you go and do the same thing. That he was greatest in the kingdom is servant of all. There's an honor and respect for what they do and the, the calling that the Lord's called them to. Those who much is given, much is required. 
But there's an accountability on that part of the minister, not just to the people, although there's a great accountability there, but to the Lord for what He's doing and how He looks out for their souls and the way He does this. James talks about a, a stricter judgment. It's not to say that, that those that aren't ministers, that aren't pastors, can get away with more. But it's that example. It's already told Timothy, hey, live your life before these people as an example of godliness to them because you're the one they're going to look to. You're the one they're going to look to to help them understand and to show them the Word of God. James says, be a doer. And that means it should be a characteristic of your life. That you do the Word of God. Not just hear about it. So these ministers, they're worthy of this double honor. They shouldn't be muzzled. They're worthy of their wages. Don't receive an accusation just like that. And if there's a problem, deal with it. Verse 21, he says, I charge you before God... And the, Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. It comes back to that minister doing these things. I'm charging you before God, before Jesus Christ and the angels that are watching out too. Not that we're worshiping angels or any of that kind of stuff. He said, there, there, there's a lot of people watching in the spiritual realm. You're accountable to them. Do these things without prejudice, doing nothing without partiality. In case you're wondering, April is my favorite. So, But you do these things, you minister to those without partiality, without prejudice. Without partiality. You, know, you, you get those sometimes and, and oftentimes in ministry the, the, the sheep for whatever reason will accuse the minister of well you're, yeah, you're always over there hanging out with those guys because you know, they're the ones that give the most money. A wise pastor never knows who does what when it comes to that. Or yeah, you like those guys over there because you know, they, they ride motorcycles too. Well, it just gives us something in common. Everybody else can get a bike and come too. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's without partiality. You minister to each one the same. Each one is as important as the other. No matter where they're at in their walk with the Lord or, or, or how they serve in ministry to the church, each person is as important as the other. Without Partiality without prejudice. Prejudice are a tricky thing, aren't they? Just because there's some things that we don't like. Usually it's those things that, 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 that we do that bug us. If we see them in somebody else, it's like, I'm going to stay away from you because you remind me of me and I don't like that. Without prejudice, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they look like, how they're dressed, what their background is, where they come from, or any of that. You know, Don Jackson and myself and, and Danny, a few of us don't like onions. And in spite of what we might say, people who do like onions really don't have moral issues. <laughs> or at least not because of the onions. There's really nothing spiritually wrong with someone that doesn't like cherry pie. They're just weird. But you cannot take those things and, and be prejudiced about those and how you minister to people. There, there's those we've, we've all, well, maybe we all haven't, but there, there's those sort of parachurch groups out there that, that are, you know, you got, you got bikers for Christ and you got, you know, I don't know what else you got out there. You got knitters for Jesus and <laughs> all that kind of stuff, you know. You get these little groups and everything, and, and it's easy for those people in those little groups to first of all let that little group, which is not a bad thing, be, take the place of the church, which is a bad thing. And then they start getting in there, well, you know, if you're not a knitter, we're really not going to waste our time ministering to you. We're here to minister to knitters, you know, or bikers or, you know, whatever, golfers. I, 
you know. And you get specialized in these things. He's saying, don't get specialized. You're there as a minister to minister to everyone. Freely you've received, freely you give to whoever comes along that needs it. Jesus Christ pours out His love in our lives through the Holy Spirit abundantly, doesn't He? What did He charge you for that? Not a thing. He paid the price on the cross when He died for our sins. He said, I want to love you so much I'm willing to take on your sin and die on the cross in your place so that you might be saved. That He's given to us freely. The love of Christ is ours because we've accepted that gift. And He says, I've given it to you freely. You give it to someone else. You give it. You're not going to run out. You won't run short. You don't have to worry about it. Just do it. Because that's what we're all called to do. It's what we're all accountable for. What have we done with this gift that Jesus has given us? This salvation that we have with this love of Christ. Have we kept it and hoarded it to ourselves? Or do we give it out? Are we prejudiced in who we give it out to? Because when's the last time you ran across someone that didn't need the love of Christ? You may have run across those that didn't want it or didn't think they did. But when's the last time you ran across someone that didn't need the love of Christ? Don't do it with prejudice or partiality do it to those who come before you whether you're a pastor or not don't do it with partiality by the way there's been more bikers led to Christ by little old ladies from knitting clubs than Christian bikers and it doesn't matter that you don't share the same background or anything you, have, you share the same need in your life and the answer is Jesus, no matter where you come from. Let's move on a little bit here. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. And that doesn't mean, you know, they can lay hands on them. I mean, don't lay hands on them. Don't, don't, don't put them in that position uh, as, uh, in leadership or anything like that. Hastily. It says, for those that are going to be a, a minister, a, a pastor or something like that, is not be a novice. Let's say get puffed up with pride. Watch them and see. You know, is, has the Lord called them to this ministry or that? It's real easy for people, for churches to just grab hold of people. Somebody comes in and it's their, their, their first Sunday. And I don't mean to pick on music stuff, but it seems like that's where, you know, one of the first places you get it. You got somebody that, that, that comes in and, hey man, you know, I can, I can play, you know, 14 different instruments and blah, 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 and all this and everything. Great, man, next Sunday, be here early and we'll put you... You gotta wait and see what's going on with them. See where their life is at. Because they may need to be ministered to before they can come up and minister. And it may be that just because that's what they've done, that, that, that God might be calling them to something else. It's real easy to grab somebody that knows how to run the cameras and stuff like that. And say, all right, you're in. You know? We've seen that throughout the, the years and everything. You get these sports figures. You know? Oh, man, you know, so-and-so would... Whatever game, the superstar guy is saved and professing Christ. And the next thing you know, he's at a, a, in, a, in a speaking circuit going from church to church to church. Well, in the meantime, this poor guy, this poor babe in Christ, hasn't begun to grow. It's like, here little baby, jump in the seat of this semi and head down the road. Yeah. And they end up crashing and burning. Because they don't have the, the discipleships, the nourishing and nurturing that it takes to grow them up into that. Maybe they have the call, but it's just beginning to, to bud, just like them little things on the trees there. 
Don't be in too big of a hurry to grab hold of them. Don't share in other people's sins. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer, isn't it? Is it? it? Ought to be. Well, you know, we just kind of wanted to relate to them, so we thought we'd, you know. That's one of those places where you, where you get kind of slippery and everything. And again, with my background in, in doing biker ministry and stuff like that, you get somebody that, that, that pops up and is like, all oh, right, we're in great Christian bikers and everything like that. I'm going to get saved and grab a, and get a motorcycle. And you grab them, you throw them out there in the ministry and everything. And the next thing you know, they're over there sitting there at the bar with some other biker from a secular club down in a couple of beers and doing whatever else and say, well, I was just ministering to them. That's grabbing hold of them too soon and putting them into that place that they're not ready for. Don't get into their sins. And again, I bring up Levi, Matthew, the tax collector. Jesus didn't sit down and say, hey, let me try this. To you, yeah, you're a knitter, not a biker. I'm going to charge you more taxes than them. <laughs> Didn't get involved in it. So keep yourself pure. You don't have to have the background or involvement in somebody's sin in their life to understand their need. Because we can all understand temptation. Can't we? The pride of life, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh. We can all understand that. We all know what it means. We all understand the need. So no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. This might be where you get that saying, well, I'm just drinking it for medicinal purposes. You know, this is not an excuse to drink just because you got something going on. You know, I got a hangnail. Hand me that bottle. Yeah. Yeah. It's telling Timothy, hey, you know, it's all right if that's what you need. Take care of yourself. <laughs> it's not an excuse to drink. Verse 24 says, Some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment, but those of some follow later. You don't always find out right there, but your sin will be found out. If not here in this life, when you come before the Lord. You might be saved, you might be a Christian, but, but there's still that, that, the, the Bema seed of Christ where you're rewarded for those things that, that, that you've done in His name. He says, likewise, he said, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. There's a lot of people that do a lot of really good, wonderful things for the Lord that nobody knows about. You don't let your right hand know what the left hand's doing. Don't go bragging about it. You know? And there's people that, that do those things and for whatever reason, because of the witness that it is, the Lord brings it to light and it's shown and we see it now. Those in their ministries and the things that they do. But either way, either way, it's not going to be hidden and it's not going to be forgotten. You know, if somebody does a good deed, they don't need to tell anybody about it. Because if it needs to be shown, the Lord will show it. If not, He's still going to reward them. It says that we come before that beam of seat and all the things that we've done, whether it's gold or precious jewels and everything, all those things we've done because of our love for Christ will be there. But everything else, all the wood, hay, and stubble will be burned off. Says, you might have a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble and that'll be burned off. You'll still be saved, but like those who you know, come through the fire. You can get there to see Jesus face to face. You might be going... <coughs> Because of all the smoke from the, the wood, hay, and stubble. But what that also means is that Jesus is so good at finding those precious jewels of faith and love among the wood, hay, and stubble. Burn the dross off to find the jewels. To find those things. No good deed will be left unrewarded by Christ. Nothing done in His name. Now, the love for Christ will be there. It also says God will not, will not be mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. To the flesh, selfishly, corruption. To the spirit, blessing. You may not see it now, but on that day, it's either going to be burned up or shine. 
And either way, the Lord's going to find it and bring those things that are pure out in front there. They cannot be hidden one way or another. So we don't always look at somebody and say, well, you know, that person over there, they just kind of hang out over there. They sit in the same seat. They come in when nobody, you know, at the, at right before things start and they leave just, right, you know, right out, first one out the door and everything. You don't know what God's doing in their life outside of here. They're not doing anything for the Lord. It's because they're not doing anything right here in this church that we see. It doesn't mean that they're not doing things for the Lord. The Lord is watching. God and everybody. What we do, we do right at, we do right there out in front in the open before God and everybody. A lot of people that don't mind doing things in front of everybody, but when they come to realize that they're doing it before God too, hopefully that changes things. And not just ministers, but all of us as believers are accountable to the Lord. We come and we give account of what we've done with the great precious gift of everlasting life that He gave us because of His grace and mercy and love for us. What have you done with it? You're accountable. Is it precious? Did you share it with all who came along in need of the love of Christ? Because that's what we're accountable for. Doing what we do as unto the Lord. Every bit of it.